my weekly vlog and podcast, and the name is coming from Jeff Quest to the world at large, over the internet, from whatever media I have access to, using whatever tools I have available. And uh, this week, one of the tools that I have available failed on me. My trusty laptop is uh, working pretty much perfect, except for the microphone. The microphone does not work at all, which kind of sucks, because that's how I was recording this uh, pretty much consistently since about the third episode or so. And I have this little thing that might at some point allow me to record audio. We may give that a try, but I don't think it's going to work very well. So I'm going to try to set this up kind of on the fly here. We've got a record mode. Let's see, voice, text, voice mode, record mode. There we go. And let's see if I can actually record something decent here. It says I have five hours remaining. Let's see if I can get that. Oh, it says it's recording. So who knows what kind of quality this is or where the microphone is on this thing. Uh, or if it's just going to keep going. Yeah, it says it's recording. Okay, so we're live. Anyway. This is a weekly broadcast to the world. Uh, and usually there is hopefully going to be pe- other people on it. I have one person who has finally expressed interest in coming on the show. But... Uh, Unfortunately, none of the people invited today uh, actually. Oh, yeah. so, oh, in the meanwhile, so, as, in the usual, as usual, I do have, have a Creative Commons track. Up. Uh, this one is kind of hard to pronounce. Uh, it's by a band called Pazza, one of the 8 bit people's artists of the 8 bit people's label that I talked about in one of the previous episodes. The song is called, I think it's Hi Hi Hi, uh, only instead of Hi, it's like H G I. So it's like you're trying to type Hi very, very quickly, and you're, you're so excited to say Hi and hi so many times that you hit the J key a bunch of times. So let's see if this plays for us and if it goes through. Uh, but in the meanwhile, I, so I guess my mom mentioned what, that there might be some ringing noise in the background. That may just be the, the microphone that I am using as a backup. There might be, I, I guess I could actually try. Uh, hold on here. On the fly, troubleshooting on the fly, of course. <laughs> it's either going to be, is the ringing gone at least? Did we like it before? Did we like it before or after? Live A-B testing going on here. We'll wait for the audience to say whether this is worse or better. Uh, if they don't say anything in a couple of minutes, I'm probably going to uh, cut that down. But in the meanwhile... Let's get the Paza queued up here. And it's just going to spin up my hard drive, which decided to stop spinning. Let's see. There we go.
Paza, and hopefully the audio is coming through still because we do have a couple of things to cover today. Uh, like last week, I was able to find a couple of stories here that are kind of interesting. One is, of course, the Christchurch call. And so the Christchurch call, I kind of saw it. I expected that it would be bad. Uh, but unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of details online about it. So I'm just going to quickly bring up the text here. I thought I had a link up here, which was agreed by the Trudeau government and among other governments worldwide, in addition to the social networks such as Facebook and probably Google, et cetera. Which is interesting that the, the social networks are coordinating with governments to control what people say and what people can communicate over top of them. So this is the, and Ezra Levant, uh, who again is kind of the, the broken clock right a couple of times a day, made a really good point about this, uh, which is that it starts really well, where it's, quote, a free, open, and secure internet is a powerful tool to promote connectivity, enhance social inclusiveness, and foster economic growth. And then he says, yeah, he, he said something wh which went along the lines of, you, you can tell uh, someone's about to impose something on you when they, they start something saying you, you are with a, a bunch of truisms and then a but. And so the more powerful the truisms, the more careful you have to be kind of watching for the but on this. And of course the but is, quote, the internet, however, is not immune from abuse by terrorists or violent extremist actors. Uh, and then it talks about how the, this is from the, the uh, direct response of the attack in Christchurch uh, by or on the Muslim community um, by a right-wing extremist, and how basically the it's the they're blaming it on the distribution of content online, such as the video of him conducting that attack, his probably his manifesto describing why he did it and what radicalized him, and which it, it, it's it's worth pointing out that the internet was not what radicalized him. And so if, if they're looking for a root cause of why that particular attack occurred, there's an interview between um, what is it, Tommy Robinson and Sargon of the Cad, where, at least according to their reading of his manifesto, again, I haven't read it yet, the, the Internet played a relatively minor role. And it was his lived experience in person uh, with the particular communities in question uh, that caused him to form the extreme beliefs that he had. And so the... But anyway... They're, they're responding to a perceived notion uh, that the reason why people kill people in, in real life is increasingly because of things that they encounter over the Internet. And this may or may not be true. I mean, there's a, an increasing amount of our life that is being spent online. Our news sources are increasingly online, and our books that we are reading are increasingly harder to get at local libraries because, again, there's 7 billion people in the world writing and thinking at any given point in time, and so if you're going to be interacting with the thoughts of anyone from anywhere in history, there's a good chance that you'll find it on the Internet. And so it talks a little bit about some of the previous groups addressing terrorist content online, Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism, and then it talks about some of the things that the various people who are agreeing to this agreement can do to quote, eliminate terrorist content and vi violent extremist content online. So it calls for, quote, collective voluntary commitments from governments, pause, okay, so when a government agrees to something, it ceases to be collective and voluntary, right? So yes, the government of Canada can agree to something, but when the government of Canada agrees to something, the citizens of Canada don't really get a choice on that, right? I mean, we can technically vote Trudeau out still, and we can remove the liberals from power and then get out of the Christchurch call. We could do that. Uh, but on some level, it's, it's not really a, a uh, voluntary thing when the government tells you to do something uh, under penalty of, uh, or under threat of some kind of penalty, right? So anyway, continuing on. And uh, online service providers intended to address the issue, the issue, this, this issue of terrorist and violent extremists content online, right? So, to a Brent, quote, prevent the abuse of the internet as also occurred in or after the Christchurch attacks, which is an interesting way of putting it, 
because, again, it, the Internet was not really being abused in these cases. If anything, the abuse that was happening on the Internet was the action by the New Zealand government to restrict uh, what people could read and to restrict their ability to have access to news describing the event. Now, there may be reasons why a mass murderer, in particular, shouldn't be covered by local news and have the, the flames kind of fanned. That there is an argument to be made there, but when you reach down in to and start throwing criminal charges at people, individual people, not news organizations, but individual people, for sharing videos and for sharing text documents and for trying to talk about them. This goes, again, too far. This is not an abuse of the Internet to, to do these things. This is an abuse of the people who are sharing content of, on the Internet by their government. That is where the abuse... And so they're framing this as an abuse of the Internet for people to uh, conduct murder and film it and display it on the internet is not, it, it's assuming that there's a use of the internet that is legitimate that they can define, right? And so the abuse here is the abuse by the governments. But of course, that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about people sharing information in a free and open way uh, and sharing information that they do not approve of. And so this is what they are trying to compromise right now. Of course, they're, they're saying in the same agreement that, quote, all action on this issue must be consistent with the principles of free, open and secure internet without compromising human rights. Quote, unquote. Very good. That's an important thing that they should be doing. And fundamental freedoms, including freedom of expression. Again, very important. It must, but continuing on, it must also recognize the internet's ability to act as a force of good, including by promoting innovation and economic development and fostering inclusive societies. That is true, and it's an interesting way of putting it, but again, it's there, there are people who are going to want to live in a closed society, and we can disagree with them that they may be a threat to an open society, and there may be means of, I guess, encountering and arguing and maybe even fighting with them on some level, but to put the internet as the battleground for this to occur put social media as the, the tool to enforce an open society it might be a step too far. So this is what the government of Canada just committed to. Quote, to counter the drivers of terrorism and violent extremism by strengthening the resilience and inclusiveness of, of our societies to enable them to resist terrorist and violent extremist ideologies, including through education, building media literacy to help counter distorted terrorist and violent extremist narratives, and to the fight against inequality. So that's something that the Trudeau government has agreed to. Now, uh, that's probably pretty mild, uh, I would say. Th th depending how it's implemented, it could be good or bad. If you were going to be serious about terrorism and violent extremist ideologies, you could do a lot worse than education, media literacy, uh, countering the narratives involved at a narrative level, at an institutional level, and by doing something about inequality that might cause people to become radicalized. Now, that, that is certainly within the, what the Trudeau Liberals were elected to do. But anyway, continuing on, quote, effective, er, ensure effective enforcement of applicable laws. And when they say applicable laws, they mean stuff like C-51, stuff that has already been agreed to in other contexts, but that, quote, prohibit the production or production of or dissemination of terrorist or violent extremist content. So we're already getting into the point where this is prohibiting thought crime and, quote, violent extremist content could be uh, very broad in content. And so, and though they do require that it be done in a manner consistent with the rule of law, which is good, and international human rights law, which is also good, including freedom of expression, which is good, it is still worrying to hear dissemination of terrorist content becoming prohibited. That is something that, again, they're... It is already kind of encoded in law in C51, but again, it's it's something that we're. What else are we agreeing to at this point? What have we not already done to prohibit the production of and distribution of violent extremist content that is not already against our laws? That is what we should be kind of wondering right now. What did we just give up? What kind of content is now prohibited? to distribute in, in Canada. If you go to the library and you want to look up information about Hamas, for example, are they going to be prohibited from giving it to you because of this Christchurch call? 
That's the kind of thing that we want to be keeping our, our eye on right now. Quote, encourage media outlets to apply ethical standards when depicting terrorist events online to avoid amplifying terrorist and violent extremist content. Again, there's an argument to be made for that. Uh, however, uh, when we start talking about applying ethical standards, there is a side effect there in that this isn't necessarily restricted to only avoiding amplifying terrorist and violent extremist content. There's a whole bunch of other things that come with uh, ethical standards in journalism. And as Gamergate certainly showed, the journalistic community is a little, shall we say, uh, uh, weak on actually implementing some of those things. And so could that be used as a means, as a stick to censor uh, could this be used as a, a stick in addition to the carrot of uh, the hundreds of millions of dollars of subsidies for the Trudeau government to control the narrative, given that they are already talking about controlling the narrative uh, elsewhere in this document? Sure. And so that is, that is something that we should be very wary of. Quote, support frameworks such as industry standards to ensure that reporting on terrorist attacks does not amplify terrorist con or, or violent extremist content without any prejudice to responsible coverage of terrorism and violent extremism. The, the responsible coverage was what Ezra Levant kind of pointed out in this, in that who is exactly going to define what is and is not responsible? Because there is going to be, for example, people who are going to try to explain what happened and why, and why the, the reasoning behind it may be involve institutional factors. Is Noam Chomsky, for example, someone who would give responsible coverage, quote unquote, according to the mainstream media outlets and the industry standard narrative of terrorism. It, it's, it's kind of worrying to see these things even discussed, never mind agreed to. So, quote, consider appropriate action to prevent the use of online services to disseminate terrorist and violent extremist content, including through collaborative actions such as awareness and raising and capacity building activities aimed at smaller online service providers, which sounds, again, good, but what kind of uh, activities are we talking about here? And what kind of pressure are they going to put on small service providers? If you don't go along with the government, what is going to happen with you? Quote, continuing on, development of the industry standards or voluntary frameworks, regulatory or policy measures consistent with the free, open and secure internet and international human rights law. So again, they keep including that, which is good, uh, but the, it, it's going to be an impossible goal. You can't just prevent terrorists from using the internet to spread their content. Even if you did it with AI, you're still building an AI machine capable of censoring at the level of content rather than mere text words or something like that. And even with just text and words, the machine for censoring content will be there, ready and waiting for the next use which could be child porn, which could be piracy and copyright infringement. But once that tool is there, it will be used and it will be expanded until it is catching other things. And so, long story short, this is a giant global agreement. And it's, it, it, I don't see the, the full list of, oh, here we go, supporters here. How, how big is this here? We have Australia, Canada, the EU, France, Germany, Indonesia, India, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Jordan, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Senegal, Spain, Sweden, and the UK, including Facebook, Google, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Twitter, YouTube, Daily Motion. So this is actually probably pretty close to half the world. It doesn't include China, Russia, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, but it could probably expand to include those. And so th this is huge. This is half the world agreeing to implement a service level and in law, a requirement for what kind of journalism can be done, a requirement for who can talk about what online, for who can talk, who can share what video online, and just building the capacity for future censorship initiatives to take place. This must be stopped in Canada, for sure, but it should be a global effort against it. And unfortunately, there is going to be some pushback on this, because especially in New Zealand, there is going to be, people are going to want to use the tragedy to implement this. And it's always going to be tempting to just allow a tragedy to define what law is everywhere because of a tragedy that happened once. That there's a ratcheting effect that's hard to undo. That once something like this happens, that everyone must react to it forever. And that it can't just be a cost of a free and open society 
that occasionally people will die, even if the, uh, the long term a system like this will cause more people to die. Because once a censorship machine is in place for governments to use around the world, they will use it to cover up people dying from things that they cause. Once you allow them to control who, what journalists can talk about what, that's the kind of thing that can be covered up and done so at a level that is more or less permanent, again, globally. Scary, scary stuff. But that's not the only thing going on in the world, uh, of course. The other thing going on in the world uh, in the past little while is, again, I've talked about Julian Assange a couple of times, and the last time it was suggested that maybe, or the two, two or so episodes ago, it was suggested that, oh, maybe he's not going to get charged with the Espionage Act, because the, all they were charging him with was these more or less minor offenses compared to what they could have charged with. And then the next episode talked about, well, maybe there's some wiggle room that they could bring in the Espionage Act. And, well, the pin dropped The from Glenn Greenwald, quote, all those who spent the last two-plus years proclaiming to be so very concerned about attacks on a free press will now have to decide whether they really mean it or whether, due to feelings about Assange, they will cheer the Trump administration's frontal assault on press freedom. WikiLeaks Julian founder Julian Assange has been charged with 17 new counts under the Espionage Act for, quote, unlawfully obtaining and disclosing, unlawfully obtaining and disclosing national defense information, i.e. for operating as a journalist outfit, disclosing what they learned to the public. That is what they are charging him with. And for this, he could hang or be executed in a firing squad or by lethal injection. He can be killed for practicing journalism in the United States. This is very much the stuff of dictatorships. When you can be killed for being a journalist and when the excuse given is, quote, national security, that gives them carte blanche to do this against anyone. Because, as what, again, we saw in the AT AT&T versus Hepting case, in the states, when the government decides that something is national security, it is a kind of get out of a trial free card. They can declare anything as national security, and the, the explanation for why is this national security can't be questioned, because the answer to that question is, well, it's national security, and that it w actually works in the court of law in the United States, unless you ha can find some information that kind of goes around what the government in the U.S. can do. So, anyway, going to Trevor uh, Kim on this one, quote, ACLU on the unprecedented charges against Julian Assange, quote, a direct assault on the First Amendment. It establishes a dangerous precedent that can be used to target all news organizations that hold the government accountable by publishing its secrets. For the first time in the history of our country, the government has brought criminal charges against the publisher against the publisher for the publication of truthful information. This is an extraordinary escalation of the Trump administration's attacks on journalism and a direct assault on the First Amendment. It establishes a dangerous precedent that can be used to target all news organizations that hold the government accountable by pub publishing its secrets. And it's equally dangerous for U.S. journalists to uncover who, who uncover the secrets of other nations. If the U.S. can prosecute a foreign publisher for violating our secrecy laws, there's nothing preventing China or Russia from doing the same. So let's compare and contrast this with the last story a little bit, right? So now it's going to be illegal in Canada for you to cover terrorist attacks, even within Canada, even on Canadian citizens, unless you toe the party line. And with the U.S. now giving the death sentence to journalists, potentially, they can have... If you travel to the States, if you're a journalist, you can be arrested under basically their law covering our news coverage and have that happen to you. Lots of people do travel to the States. This is, again, this, the, the combination of these two things is scary, but Assange being threatened with this is bad enough. So it, it's yet to be seen how he's going to fight this, but this is kind of the worst case scenario as far as how WikiLeaks could, could turn out, where they're going to be the target of this campaign. They're, they've already been, their funds, sources of funds have been attacked for years. Thankfully, Bitcoin exists, otherwise they would have folded a long time ago. But uh, this, this is, this is the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the shoe dropping, right? This is when people talked about, oh, you know, when Trump gets elected, we're going to lose all kinds of rights and 
the U.S. is going to go into, you know, full dictatorship mode, and people kind of talked about this as a, well, no, it's not going to go that bad, and he, he's got, there's all kinds of checks and balances between him being able to do this sorts of thing, and yes, he's going to gain control of the Supreme Court, and yes, he's got a Republican House or whatever, but it, it's not going to be that bad. Well, here we go. This is an example of that, something well over the line, and sure, the Espionage Act has been used uh, on other uh, leakers, but this is this is going to be a big show trial, and it's going to be one to really try to silence people and get, uh, cause a chilling effect in journalism when the or the news industry itself is is having a lot of financial problems and is not going to be able to react. So one thing to watch is to see whether your news source covers this, what kind of details they provide about this, what they how they take this, because if they are not paying attention or are trying to basically cheerlead the Trump administration on this, you can be pretty sure that they're not going to be reliable, to say the least, on other matters. So, there's that going on. And while that's going on, I just wanted to kind of take a little bit of a break here to talk a little bit about Alex Jones and how he has been blocked from uh, so many platforms over the past couple of months. Everything from Pinterest to Facebook to Twitter, uh, all of the social media platforms, using reasoning very similar to the Christchurch call reasoning, is trying to restrict him from being able to put out his message. And sure, he is, you know, he sells snake oil. Like the stuff in his store is like definitely exploitative of the people who come to his, the, the paranoid people coming to his website. And his analysis, like, he, he probably goes about as deep as I do, which is to say, not all that deep. And sometimes he gets things wrong. Does he deserve to be removed from Facebook and Twitter and have his whole uh, access to the, the social world uh, increasingly restricted? No, he does not. There was an article on InfoWars, uh, and I wasn't able to confirm this, but I want to kind of do a test here. Uh, which is, they were trying to make the ar argument that, quote, mentioning Alex Jones without insulting him is a ban-worthy offense on Facebook. I, even if you have a, a, a social media presence on Facebook specifically, uh, they were saying that pe you can get entirely deleted and suspended by talking about someone. By talking about an official enemy of the system, i.e. Alex Jones, uh, without in some way insulting or gi giving some kind of negative feedback in his direction. Now, maybe this is happening, maybe it's not happening. Again, I can't confirm or deny <laughs> one way or the other. Uh, but the fact that this is the level we are at, where this be is, is conceivable, it is possible for us to get even to this point. Maybe in this case it's not true. Maybe in this case it's, it's only... Um, it, it, it's up to that point, but no further, and that it doesn't actually get that bad. But when you are at that point where s someone makes that claim, and they're already being censored on Pinterest and Twitter and Facebook, and ev everywhere they go, they're being cut off from having access to a million follower fan base, then at least it's credible that it could be happening. And then the, the biggest question on top of that is why? What is it that they're saying? What is it that they're trying to get across that is so dangerous? And especially given the Trump war on WikiLeaks and whistleblowers, it is there's kind of like an you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? If you're not sufficiently pro-Trumpist, you run the risk of being kind of censored on that level. Uh, but if you are pro <laughs> sufficiently pro-Trumpist, you're still kind of censored and cut off. And the, the only people who are kind of squeaking through are those who can find a, a little bit of a middle ground, an apolitical middle ground, where they aren't interfering with the powers that be, especially the, the, the social media network powers that be, and what they see as acceptable public policy. This is where the danger is where we have the, only this middle ground where we're being directed to is a whole world. It's, with the Christchurch call, billi literally billions of people now having re only responsible journalists, or quote-unquote, and quote, responsible journalism, according to a, a government definition. Uh, so, ag again, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine from the outset 
what public policy we are going to be directed into and when terrorism specifically comes up as a con uh, consequence or as a, um, a part of that policy, uh, will we be able to question it? And will people like Alex Jones, who, to his credit, he does a good job of questioning uh, authority. And he's kind of not done as good of a job since Trump got elected, I think. Um, but he's still out there. He's still at least asking questions and trying to get people to see another way of looking at the world whether you agree with him or not, whether you think he's crazy or not, whether you th think that by supporting Trump he's guilty of causing this kind of censorship or not, uh, all of that is irrelevant. He's still out there, he's still trying to break people out of the, the kind of mold, and he's, he's doing it with his voice. That's all he's doing. And so I personally have InfoWars as my homepage, and most of the time I just sort of give it a look and go, okay, well, whatever. And some of the stories are just ridiculous and stupid. Like, they're concerned about, at a news source on InfoWars scale, the censorship of a 14-year-old girl, for example. Now that, again, it's important to talk about censorship when it happens, but they're talking about it because it's their, their team, their tribe, their side being censored. And it, it, it's, it's like they, they focus on that and miss the, the bigger picture on the other side uh, sometimes. So it's, it's kind of unfortunate. But So there's that going. What else is going on? other than InfoWars being censored. Uh, well, Reddit, uh, quote, just quietly added uh, to their list of banned content and censored content, quote, 3D printing files to produce firearms, unquote. Which, uh, quote, and this is from one John Stokes, quote, I wonder if it's anything to do with the Mendez letter that just went out. Quote, U.S. Senator Bob Menendez, ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and an outspoken opponent of the Trump administration's actions while allowing a Texas company to publish the downloadable designs for 3D printable firearms today, called out the CEOs of Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Craigslist, Reddit, and Twitter to proactively block any distribution of 3D gun blueprints on their platforms. So isn't it interesting that we've got the Christchurch call, which is preventing us, or kind of forcing companies to censor one kind of content, i.e., quote, terrorist extremist content. And then we've got another that is now forcing the, most of the same companies to restrict having access to 3D printable gun parts, which, by the way, are it is legal in the United States to own a gun. It is legal in the United States to manufacture a gun. It is legal in Canada to own designs for objects, uh, simple objects like a lever and a tube, and uh, most of the parts for a gun are pretty simple mechanical objects. Uh, there's nothing magical about a gun, uh, really, that precludes understanding how one works and studying it. And yes, with a 3D printer, you can then instantiate and create something from an idea, from a design, but the files themselves are not very large. And the only reason why restricting them on platforms like Microsoft and Facebook and Yahoo and Google will work is because people don't have the option to share files <laughs> among themselves without these platforms increasingly. If the internet was working as kind of it can work, by anyone sharing information with anyone, a restriction on these big platforms would be pointless because you would be able to just go around them. Unfortunately, for many people, going around these big platforms is increasingly not a possibility. And so this could be an effective way of restricting what people can and cannot 3D print. And sure, it's going to start with guns, but it's not going to end at guns. It's going to go to stuff like Four Thieves Vinegar. It's going to go to stuff like sexual content um, of various kinds. And so this is, again, another thing to watch. Now, Reddit, I think, is totally compromised. I think Reddit is, is so far, it's probably the worst of the, the social media networks in terms of the, the, they're openly trying to manipulate people uh, using their technology to, and using censorship specifically. And it's, from the perspective of an old Reddit user, it was really obvious how they were doing it. And so when we see something like 3D printable files that are just not allowed anymore, again, that, that's something that we can go, okay, well, not only should we have access to these files, but Reddit itself should be, we, we should be moving away from using Reddit for basically anything. Now, it's easy for me to do that because I was kicked off. For some of you, I understand it's going to be hard, or, or it's going to be quite hard because Reddit is quite addictive. And especially if you have uh, problems in your social life, 
you're going to be wanting that little bit of a dopamine hit from what's new, going on new in the world. And unfortunately, media like this doesn't give you as much of that dopamine hit. So it's going to be kind of an open problem of what can we do about this? How can we replace Reddit? Yes, there's the Fediverse. The Fediverse helps a little bit, but there's that to kind of consider. What else is going on? Okay, well, there's a documentary, and unfortunately I was not able to get a copy of this, uh, is called, quote, uh, What She... or Unplanned. Uh, and this is from unplannedfilm.com. What she saw changed everything. Quote, international release, summer 2019. Now, this is a copyrighted movie. Unfortunately, it's not Creative Commons. Uh, so you can't just download it and share it. Uh, but they have an update on their website. Quote, Up Unplanned is not coming to Canada. Theaters have refused to allow the movie to be seen. And so their story. Quote, Unplanned is the inspiring true story of one woman's journey of transformation. All Abby Johnson ever wanted to do was help women. As one of the youngest Planned Parenthood client, er, clinic directors in the nation, she was involved in upwards of 22,000 abortions and counseled countless women about their reproductive choices. Her passion surrounding a woman's right to choose even led her to become a spokesperson for Planned Parenthood, fighting to enact le legislation for the cause she so deeply believed in. Until the day she saw something that changed everything, leading Abby Johnson to join her former enemies at 40 Days for Life, uh, to become one of the most ardent pro-life speakers in America. At least according to them, Unplanned is the most important movie you'll ever see. Somehow I doubt that, but whatever. Co the most controversial issue of our time. No matter which side of the fence you're on, no one will leave this film unmoved by Abby's journey. So, pausing for a second here, they're appealing to the pro-choicers on this. Uh, this is a definitely pro-life movie, uh, without a doubt. But it's, it's an attempt at an argument. Uh, maybe not a rational argument, it's an artistic kind of appeal to emotion type thing. But you got to give them credit for trying. And it looks like the production quality is quite high on this. This is like a, uh, They claim it's a blockbuster in the U.S., which I would probably believe that claim. And it kind of talks about where it's from. But long story short, uh, they try to get this sh scene in Canada. The theaters here are blocking them. So now, it would be a little bit different if it was one theater or a couple theaters in the country, right? If it was just even one of the bigger chains, then sure. But they're getting completely blocked here. And so this is actually a form of censorship that this, this movie is hitting here. And so it's, oh, we can't hear nothing. Oh, lovely. Are we coming through now? <laughs> Have we got audio? At least this thing's recording. We'll see how, how much this thing is actually effectively recording. Apparently I've been talking for like a half an hour and nobody heard me. Wonderful. I might go a little bit longer to compensate for that. Long story short, unplannedfilm.com. If you're in Canada, there's, I guess you could fill out their inquiry form. They say that they want people to, to do screenings for them in Canada, if, if you can hack that. And, I mean, I that's the sort of thing I would love to do, uh, personally, uh, is get access to this film and do a, a screening. It's a banned movie. Why not? Now, there's nothing saying, uh, kind of like Alex Jones-wise, that you couldn't display the movie and then do like a point-by-point -point rebuttal of it. That would be totally cool if you're into that sort of thing. But I just think that the fact that there's this movie that you can't see is that's what I want to see, right? And I, I hope that that would be the sort of thing you would want to see, too. So there's that unplanned film. Something to maybe watch. And like I said, it's not Creative Commons, so yes, it's censored, but it's not Creative Commons. I'm kind of torn on this one. I'm going to try to find it. I'm, I'm going to try to watch it. But it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to, to arrange this, uh, given some changes in my life coming up, which maybe we'll talk about on a future episode, but we do not have time today. Let's see what the next thing is. Uh, the next thing is the Vancouver Airport. So this is from Global News. Why VR under fire after blocking ads with information on travelers' and privacy rights. So the quote, uh, Vancouver International Airport is getting plenty of heat for rejecting an advertisement aimed at educating travelers about their rights. The, event, the ads were commissioned by the digital rights nonprofit Open Media and were meant to be posted the, at the YVR terminal of the Canada Line. They were large, bright ads with simple, very simple text that said, your phone is not safe at the border with a link to our website, said Open Media Executive Director Laura Tribe. Tribe said the ads were intended to ensure passengers were aware of their rights when they are in a border area 
when they are legally required to do and what protections they are afforded. There's not a lot of information available to you once you find yourself in that scenario. So how can people be better prepared, she said. Quote, the information on our phone is some of the most personal, sensitive information, but when you're at a border, you have no more rights when it comes to your info on a phone than you do having your suitcase searched or your bag of t-shirts or pants, quote unquote. So I would actually argue against this. pausing for a moment here. The There has been two cases in since about 2001 uh, where people have fought the CBSA's or CSBA or whatever's uh, apparent right to search our electronic equipment, or at least the content of it. The Elaine Philippon case, and a recent case that I think it's like some Mason. Uh, don't quote me on that part. But it's a recent case that has not been completed yet. The Elaine Philippon case was settled out of court. Uh, so w whatever happened, there was no binding nature of the outcome. So it is not yet decided in Canadian law what they have the right to do and not do with your equipment. Now they can take your equipment and they can detain you for not giving them a password to it. They can keep you from traveling, that's for sure. But the final outcome of a trial of what happens to your stuff and you, anything could happen at this point. When it gets, it could be, it could go right to the Supreme Court and it'll take years for that to happen. And by then, there'll probably be some other kind of technology where we'll have to go through the same thing over and over again, basically asking the question of our government, do we have the right to travel with any degree of privacy whatsoever? Because if you're required to give access to your handheld computing device, your phone, there's nothing keeping them from requiring the same absence of permission to searching your brain when we start hooking these things up to our brain, which is coming. The, the tech for that is on its way. And so the battle has to be fought now, not then, but now, to win the right to have some degree of privacy. Because if we don't win it, we will be faced with a situation where our own minds will be forced to be read at the border, and from there it will be elsewhere in our life. That is where the battle has to happen. So anyway, continuing on. A tribe said an organization was given no reason for why the ads were rejected nor any information on how they could tr change them to be accepted. Vancouver officials would not agree to an on-camera interview, or YBR, I guess, but re released a statement by email. In reviewing Open Media's request to, take, to place advertising at the airport, we determined that it did not serve all our stakeholders as we felt it pitted two groups against each other and also had the potential to add undue stress to the travel experience, wrote spokesperson Brock Penner. Which, a big fuck you to Brock Penner, by the way. The undue stress is because they have no, uh, their rights are being violated. And so Brock Penner and the Vancouver uh, Airport had a choice here. They could say, hmm, well, our customers' rights are being violated. Maybe we should support our customers. Uh, and not just our customers, but air travelers around the world, or around Canada, which includes a lot of people around the world who fly to Canada and through Canada. But they chose not to. They chose to try to ignore the problem and to make it somebody else's problem, i.e. their customer. So that, that's kind of a really jerk move on their part. And the C-sharp on uh, Libre.audio Crow's Nest uh, instance of the Fediverse made a good point, which is that it's not an infringement of your rights that's a problem, C. It's knowing about it, quote, stresses people out, unquote. And that's exactly the, the problem. It should stress you out that your rights are being violated. It should piss you off that you're not able to fly in this country with, a, with your privacy being violated. And what, so the government requiring your papers, please, as the Soviet Union did before the Iron Curtain fell. It should stress you out. This is a very stressful thing for everyone. It should cause stress. The fact that they're trying to ignore it doesn't get rid of the stress. It gives a false sense of security, a false sense of complacency that people can develop out of ignorance of what the government is actually doing to them. So, YDR aims to be non-political and open media's borderprivacy.ca promotes an online petition with a political call to action directed towards government officials, quote-unquote. Again, th this aims to be non-political is bullshit. They're aiming to be political by supporting their government and the government's claim to have access to our own private thoughts and notes and journals and pictures and what have you. So, continuing on from um, air passenger rights, or Gabor Lucas, 
This is wrong on many levels. This is wrong because passengers should be aware of their rights, and it's wrong because it's a form of censorship. Lucas uh, told Global News and Open Media that, uh, that Open Media would be well served to take the airport to court. My understanding is that airports are fulfilling, in practical terms, a government's function, and as such, they should be subject to the Canadian Charter. They cannot limit the freedom of speech of what should or shouldn't appear on their billboards. Lucas said that airport appears to be trying to behave like a private corporation on one hand while acting in the interest of the government on the other, which is exact, exactly the problem here. It's the, the anything against the interests of a private or of the large corporations is seen to be political. It's seen to be unprofessional. It's seen to be something that can't be allowed, which again directs us into this kind of narrow range of public policy debates that we're allowed to have or not have. A, a, a narrow range of, di or of narratives that the government sees fit to not cause terrorism, uh, a, narrow a narrow range of rights that we are allowed to cling to, not including basic rights like the right to private thoughts, to private notes, to uh, have your uh, personal papers and writing uh, subjected to reading by the government. But the case that is being brought to increasingly close to the Supreme Court right now, it concerns a matter of client uh, or lawyer-client privilege, uh, where the a lawyer was traveling and his suit uh, involved clients' personal information, and a lawyer in Canada doesn't have to divulge his private information to the government, even kind of when compelled uh, under something like terrorist law. There is a right to a fair trial, at least in some senses, and that includes the ability to ha inform your lawyer of what you did and didn't do so that he can argue in your favor. So, quote, the airport was colluding with airlines to keep passengers in the dark about their rights. If passengers are well informed, it means airlines will have to pay more and passengers will demand their rights, quote unquote. Which is exactly the point. If passengers knew that their rights were being violated, there's a good chance they may act on it. And that's what they're afraid of. And so this isn't just a question of the airport and what the airport should, and should, should or shouldn't be have in it, but news sources as well. Now, Global News, by covering this, good job. Good job on Global. But where is this in the Chronicle Journal, though? This should be a front page news everywhere. This is huge information in Canada that we're not allowed to know our rights, at least when in the places where it would be best actually implemented. So that's probably long enough for today. I did go a little bit further because of the problem, technical problems, and again, I don't know if they're going to be resolved in the near term because of quote unquote changes to my life coming up. But in in <laughs> in the week to come, hopefully uh, you go out and, and see the two films or the, see the film that I mentioned. There's an, another film that I wanted to mention, but I guess I'll talk about that next week. Uh, but yeah, go go find Unplanned the film. We'll see how it goes. And if somebody can find a copy for me, I would love to have it. I may not um, actually share it with anyone else. But, you know, just for future preservation's sake when something like that gets censored. As usual, if you want to uh, support this show, that support might go for a new microphone, for example, uh, there's Subscriber Star Villages in Bitcoin. And if you have anything you'd like me to talk about or change, uh, hopefully I have like a little bit of a window, which is different today. See, I pay attention to the background. is actually different. Maybe I'll have a different background next episode. So uh, if there's anything that you'd like me to cover, especially Creative Commons music, I'd love to have more Creative Commons music so I could share more in Creative Commons music. And uh, I can only do that with your suggestions. So send me something on Ricochet, Facebook, or anywhere else this video is posted. And I will see you next episode. Hopefully this audio recorded. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty hilarious. See you later.